So, like I mentioned yesterday, we're now going to move on to talking about, lar largely we're going to be talking about time harmonic con combustion phenomenon, although we'll start out a little bit more general. And in particular, what we're going to do here for D, which we'll spend the next two hours talking about, is talking about just disturbances in general, um, disturbances in, uh, in reacting flow environments, um, how they propagate, how they're excited, I'll talk about how under certain circumstances you can get self-excited oscillations, which gives you this combustion instability phenomenon. And an important part of um, understanding where disturbances come from in, in, in combustion environments is, is trying to understand how they interact with flames. And so what I'll specifically be talking about then in the last hour of class is, is when you excite a flame harmonically, how it responds. So get, like, like I mentioned the first day of class, this problem is, is kind of a subset of a larger class of problems of what happens when you disturb flames. You know, you can, you can excite a flame with a, a transient flow disturbance or a broadband turbulent disturbance or a narrowband um, harmonic disturbance. And so many of you will have, been, have seen the turbulent flame problem where you're interested in looking at how do time average mass burning rates change as you change turbulence intensity. What we're going to be looking at here with E is we're not so much going to think about how do time averages change. We're going to be look at the, looking at the fluctuations themselves. If you have a, have a perturbation, what is the resulting perturbation in the heat release? So that'll probably be a new problem for, for a number of you. So that's, that's kind of our roadmap. So let's um, now move on. So this here on the right-hand side is um, kind of a breakdown of, of our discussion around disturbance propagation and generation. So what I'm going to do is first I kind of want to motivate this problem. And I motivated it a little bit on the first class, but I'm, I'm going I'm to dig into it a little bit deeper. And, and one of the key reasons we care about how flames respond to harmonic disturbances is this problem of combustion instabilities. And, I, and, and I'll talk about this in, in a minute here, but this is a huge problem. It's the single biggest problem associated with developing low emissions systems. It is one of the biggest problems associated with developing the F1 engine used for putting the man on the moon. It's a big problem for afterburners, uh, for jet engines. Um, as, as things like water heaters and um, home heaters for, for your house, as these systems are becoming low NOx, um, the same problem is, 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 is really rearing its head. So really, really big deal. And basically what's happening here is you have heat release oscillations, all right? So the, the rate at which the flame is converting reactants to products is not constant. It's changing in time. So in a turbulent flow, it's, there's always a certain amount of, of noise or roar that, of, of the flame, and that's making sound. Um, but as soon as you confine this system, so if you take a flame and it's just sitting out in the open, it just makes noise. That's, that's open loop forcing. Basically, the flame makes sound. But as soon as you confine it, you create a situation where you can get feedback, where those sound disturbances propagate back and redisturb the flame. So in fact, the, the, the latter half of this class in E, we're going to be specifically looking at this part of this loop is how does, um, what is the sensitivity of the flame to make sound? And um, you know, this is a simulation of a, uh, of a um, annular combustor. You're looking at a slice of the annular combustor. You're looking at pressure contours. And um, this is actually pressure contours during an ignition event. Uh, so they're basically seeding ignition, and you can see the pressure pulse from the ignition propagating around, but you can also see it bouncing around inside of the combustion chamber. You can see it is, if you look at this mixing section, you'll see that there's the pressure is bouncing around there. If you have a subsonic flow, you know, acoustic oscillations can go all over the place. So this is something you can all do at home. Uh, you can blow over a beer bottle. You can blow over a milk jug. It's got natural frequencies. So in the same way, a combustion chamber has certain, a subsonic combustion chamber has natural frequencies at which it wants to oscillate. Um, you know, for example, uh, a beer bottle or a milk jug, whenever you combine a volume, excuse me, Whenever you combine a volume with a constriction, a neck, you get what's called a Helmholtz mode. And so in this case, it turns out to be 190 hertz. So this is actually a, a friend of mine who sells, um, who sells uh, systems to monitor pressure pulsations in large power plants. And apparently, he was sitting in his trade booth, and he was bored. Um, and he turned his full $300,000 system 
sort of fascinating problem of recording the spectrum of what happened when he blew over a beer bottle. And that's what he got. So you can see this 190 hertz peak here, but then you can also see there's this peak here at 1225 and 775. These are axial modes. These are modes bouncing around back and forth this way. You'll see this, these ones out here at 3800 and 10,600 hertz. These are transverse modes which are bouncing around back and forth that way. All right, so what, what I'm going to show in the next couple slides are, are two pieces to this. First key issue here is that flames are sensitive to disturbances, all right? In fact, a wonderful contribution that one of you could make to, to the world of making the world a cleaner, better place for our children is coming up with a configuration where flame, an, an, an insensitive flame. So if you were to perturb a flame, make it such that the heat release rate of that flame doesn't oscillate in time, that the heat release doesn't care. It just keeps burning the fuel and air in a nice, steady way, even though it's, being, even though it's oscillating. But, but basically what's happening is the flame is sensitive to disturbances, and it gives you heat release oscillations. So this is a really, really nice simulation um, experiment. This is done by Sebastian Candel and, and Daniel Durox and um, a few others at uh, Ecole Centrale, France. And very simple experiment. So imagine taking a, a Bunsen flame, all right? So you're looking here, straight piece of tubing, laminar flow, high school chemistry stuff, and then you light the flame. So without any disturbances, the flame would just have this nice V shape like you would have in a Bunsen flame. And then what they did was they um, upstream, so imagine this is a straight piece of pipe, they basically uh, put a speaker right here. And so they're driving oscillations up and down. And this is an instantaneous picture, and I will show you a movie, which is not linked. If you see it, yell. Is it down here somewhere? Oh, right there, yeah. All right. So you're looking at a Schlieren image here, OK? Oh, no, don't do that. We'll get to that one in a little bit later. I think we're OK, right? All right. So this is a Schlieren image. And so you're looking at density gradients, right? So this is the flame. What's this? What's this thing out here doing? Do we know? It's not a flame. It's just the the hot combustion products are mixing with ambient, right? So um, what you what you know is then is that between the fl between this edge here and this edge here, that's that gives you a a indicator of the volume of the combustion products. All right. Um, because you have hot products flowing out, but it's still it's a cold room, so this is what you get this strong density jump here. Everything upstream of this interface is reactants, so everything between these interfaces is hot products. Everything out here is just ambient. And so when you perturb this thing, nice simple little laminar flame, you can clearly see you're exciting these wrinkles on the flame front. And we're going to spend lots of time talking about this more later, so, and, and we can actually analyze this quantitatively really really nicely and predict the space-time dynamics of the flame. But you're exciting these wrinkles. Notice they're convecting downstream. Um, now, how, from looking at this image, I can tell you all that the heat release rate is oscillating. Somebody tell me how I know it's oscillating. Um, the, well, the, the, the amount of light given off by the flame from cumuluminescence is oscillating. Um, so that's right. Uh, there's another way. This is not chemiluminescence. That's right. But um, one could probably say, well, the surface area is increasing. So, yes, yeah, so we have to be careful. These are density gradients. But, but, but there's a, a, a very direct way of when you look at this image. The what? So, so the, the angle doesn't, so the, the answer was the angle changing. The fact that the angle's changing does not necessarily mean that the rate of heat release is oscillating. It means that the position of the flame is moving, but it doesn't mean that the rate of heat release is oscillating. 
The, uh, the best way to tell you, I'll just jump ahead and I'll give you the answer, is, is that remember if you remember between the flame and this interface, this is the volume of products. And you can clearly see that, that the product volume is, is oscillating in time. So what's happening is this is telling you that the volume flow rate coming out of the flame is oscillating in time. Right? So in other words, the rate of conversion of reactants to products is oscillating in time. So actually when I said how do you know that the heat release is oscillating, well, you don't, but, bec but what you do know is that the rate of consumption, the rate of generation of products is oscillating. That's, you can directly see that by looking at the, the, the fluctuation in this, in this wake. Um, and so when the, rate, the, when the rate of conversion of reactants to products is oscillating, that generates sound. Okay? So in other words, this flame is an amplifier. You hit it with a sound wave, it gives you a heat release oscillation, and this flame is actually going to amplify it. It gives you even more sound than you started with. All right. That's part one. The other key issue that causes combustion instabilities is the fact that the entire combustor system is sensitive to sound waves. So l let me explain what I mean by that. When you have when you have the flame, it's inherently sensitive to disturbances and it amplifies them. It makes sound. Once you create that sound, if you have a sub, if every, anywhere that the flow is subsonic, those sound waves are going, right? They're like fish swimming everywhere and finding every place in your combustor. They, they go everywhere. That, that wasn't a good analogy. They're, um, I don't know, they, they, but the sound goes everywhere, right? So you, it goes upstream. I showed you that in that movie before. In fact, if you have you have a whole fuel supply system, and if the fuel supply system is not choked, the sound wave goes zinging up into the fuel supply system, and the whole fuel uh, line will be oscillating. And in fact, people oftentimes will put a pressure sensor in their fuel line, and they'll see the pressure's oscillating in the fuel line. Um, if the whole fuel line, if there's pressure oscillations in the fuel line, that means that the mass flow rate of fuel and or air into the system is oscillating. And so again, that's a that's a that's going to give you a feedback mechanism that amplifies disturbances. So the, uh, the main thing is that, that in a subsonic system, the whole combustor is, is alive and, and, and oscillating at this frequency. Just to illustrate this, I have a fun little movie to show all of you. Um, Okay, so just make sure everybody understands what we're doing here. PVC pipe, whole bunch of little holes drilled in it. He's flowing fuel through it, through all those little holes, and there's a speaker on the left-hand side. Okay? All right, as you can see, we have a nice standing place, a little bit of oscillation from the vibrations in the hose. Let's throw some sound in there, see what happens. Let's start with a 449 hertz frequency. As you can see, this sets up a standing wave, and we can see, well, the emerging sine curve. 
So I hope that demonstrates that whole that idea that uh, what happens when you have a, the, the whole combustor sensitive to acoustic waves is that. So I, I want to back up for a minute. And I, I actually not even talk about combustion for a minute. It turns out that this combustion instability issue, it's part of a larger class of, of problems called thermoacoustics. And thermoacoustics is basically the interaction of heat and sound. Because what is it that make, what, what makes the flame make sound? It's that, it's that expansion of gases. A flame is, that's what we call a monopole, a monopole sound source. Um, where you can have unsteady expansion of gases, a flame can do that, or just any Anything that causes a, a gas to expand and contract, like a, a change in temperature. And so uh, the, uh, you can actually set up self-excited oscillations in other ways, too. And I'm gonna just going to show you another movie here. And this, this is a very simple experiment. You can, all, you can make one at home. This is a reactor tube. It's one of my favorite physics demonstrations. At the point marked in the tube, there's a small metal gold. The demonstration involves heating the gauze in the function for a few seconds. When the function is removed, the tube sings at its resonant frequency. The resonance does not occur if the tube is tipped on its side, but it does return if the tube is placed back vertical. Resonance also does not occur if the tube is placed upside down. The explanation as to how it makes the sound encompasses a wide variety of physics. The tube was invented by reduction of this Petrus reactor who died at the end of the 19th century. If you want to try and puzzle out how it makes the sound, then pause the video now. The Bunsen burner heats up the gauze fairly quickly, which becomes red hot. A convection current of warm air rises up the tube to begin with, but it will soon subside once the Bunsen is removed. Air in the vicinity of the red gauze is heated up. Note that the center of the tube is above the position of the gauze. The region of hot air causes the pressure to increase at this point, which forces air out of both ends of the tube. This is essentially a longitudinal pressure wave. When it reaches the open ends of the tube, it partially reflects back inside the tube. Now, colder air has moved upwards past the red hot gauze. This air is colder because it has been below the gauze, and hot air tends to rise due to convection. The air particles that have just risen past the hot gauze are heated, and so the pressure rise again. This provides the driving force for the resonance. The air is forced out of the tube once more, and then it reflects, and so the cycle repeats. Note, of course, that this animation is rather simplified. There will be rather more air molecules than I've drawn, and there will be a random motion too, but it does give the general idea. This final slide represents the sounding wave that's set up in the pipe where an area is a maximum vibration at the top and bottom of the tube and a node or stationary point at the centre. The wavelength of the sound emitted should be twice the length of the pipe. The reactor tube makes an excellent puzzle that encompasses lots of areas of physics, heat transfer, gas laws, sound and sounding waves. This is a reactor tube. All right. So, um, yeah, so that's an example where there's, there's no flame, the only reason they use that flame is to heat that piece of, 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 uh, of metal mesh up. You can do the same experiment with thermal resistance wire, then you don't even need the, need the flame to heat it up. You just, you know, you, you, you can use nichrome wire and run an electric current through it and, then, and it will oscillate on its own. But, uh, so, that's, so, so that's thermoacoustics. Turns out, like I said, there's a whole field. You can actually turn that, turn that phenomenon backwards on itself, you can actually, by forcing oscillations in a tube, you can actually drive, um, you can drive uh, heat transfer in the, in the opposite direction it wants to go. So in fact, the, uh, the, the, on the space shuttle in the International Space Station, the refrigerator is a thermoacoustic device. They have a, a sp and, and the reason they like those is there's a, a low part count. You just have to have a speaker and then, and then it works. Um, Okay, so I mentioned before, I just, I'll just show you a couple quick examples on this combustion instability problem. So, huge issue with liquid rockets. So, just as a simple example, the F-1 engine, it's the, you know, the largest thrust engine ever developed in the United States. It was used on the Saturn V rocket. It had an enormous instability problem. They had um, pressure oscillations over, over 1,000 PSI, 
which would just destroy the engine in, in, in fractions of a second. And they did 3,200 full-scale tests. 2,000 of those tests were just basically trial and error tests where they were fooling around with adding these, you can see these baffle things. These are, are there to disrupt acoustic wave motions. And they did that to, to get rid of the instabilities. Um, you know, afterburners used on military devices or ramjets, they, they'll, they'll get these instabilities. Um, solid rockets, so for example, um, the space shuttle. Not, no longer flying, but you know there's those big white boosters on the side of the space shuttle. Well, every time that thing took off, they had an instability. It was a relatively small instability. It was about 1 to 3 PSI, um, and at about, about 100 hertz. So it turns out that for that flight application, 1 to 3 PSI, although that caused a lot of vibration because 1 PSI is 33,000 pounds of thrust. That's a big, big nozzle. Um, the, you know, those, those uh, boosters only had to survive for two minutes or something like that, so it wasn't a big deal. Uh, 1 to th 3 PSI would be excessive for something like a power generation application because in a power generation application, they like to design these plants to run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, three years straight. So then 3 PSI can make a big difference. It can mean you've got to have a, a forced outage of your system after a few months rather than a few years. Um, yeah, so there's lots of really interesting examples of, of where they've had these nasty instabilities. Um, let's see. Okay, so that's just kind of an, an, a motivator, an overview. Now I want to dig into some equations a little bit. And first, and, and first what I want to do is I want to show you how we can decompose disturbances into fundamental disturbance modes. Okay. In order to get things started, I'm going to make a number of relatively significant assumptions, and then we'll, then we'll talk about relaxing those assumptions later. But what I want to do is I'm going to assume that I have very, very small disturbances which are superposed upon a spatially homogeneous background flow. So what, what I mean by that is my background flow, when I say it's spatially homogeneous, I mean that the temperature is everywhere uniform, the flow velocity is everywhere spatially uniform, the density is everywhere spatially uniform, kind of like the air in this room. And there are, there's a disturbance superposed upon it. So, for example, when I'm talking to you, you're hearing acoustic waves, which I'm, I'm generating in my, in my vocal cords, and the pressure in this room is nominally about 14.7 pounds per square inch, and then it's oscillating up and down above, that, above and below that value of a few millionths of a PSI because of the sound wave. Okay, so that's what we're talking about here. And um, so what we can do then is we can take all of our physical variables, for example, pressure or density or velocity, which are functions of space and time, and I can decompose them into what I'm going to call their base component which is the value of the pressure in the absence of oscillations. And by assumption, I said I'm going to assume it's spatially homogeneous. So these base values are, are not functions of space. They're just constants. So, so for example, P0 in this room would be 14.7 PSI, plus a disturbance. So the subscript 1 here denotes a small disturbance which is added to it, which is a function of space and time. Now, what I want to do well, what I, I don't have time to prove it to you, but basically what I'm going to tell you is that there are three fundamental types of disturbances. And when you make a measurement or when you do a DNS or you do a, a, a some sort of simulation and you, let's say you measure the pressure at a given point or you measure the velocity, I'm going to kind of call that sort of a, well, I'm going, I will call that a, uh, a, that, that's your measurable, that's your observable variable. So the velocity is something you measure. But what, I wanna, what I'm going to argue with you is, is that a, a better way to think about that, rather than trying to understand the space-time dynamics of the velocity itself, what I want to show you is that there, that velocity is actually a superposition of three more canonical types of disturbances, and you're measuring the superposition of those three disturbances. And so if you want to understand the space-time dynamics of the velocity, it's much easier you'll have a much easier time if you understand the space-time dynamics of these canonical disturbances. You understand what they're doing, then you add them up, and you say, okay, so that's why the pressure does this, and the velocity does that, and the density does this, and they're acting differently. Um, and these three canonical disturbances are sometimes called the vorticity mode, the acoustic mode, and the entropy mode. All right? 
So I'm just pulling these equations out of a hat. But if you're wondering where this comes from, if you take the Navier-Stokes equations, you linearize it, um, and then you can do some, do some analysis to show that there's these three canonical types of disturbances, which all of your observable variables like pressure, velocity, density, et cetera, consist of. OK, so let's see. Now, vortical disturbances, in, in the, um, again, given these assumptions of, of uniform flow, vortical disturbances describe a simple convection equation. Capital D denotes the substantial derivative. The subscript not here denotes the convection by the mean velocity. So let me just explain this notation. So in other words, in general, this, uh, the substantial derivative is nonlinear because you get convection of disturbances by themselves. But it's, it's the convection of the disturbance by the, by, the, by the base flow velocity. So what this tells you is that for a, uh, a, uh, a spatially uniform flow, you know, all those source terms that you're used to seeing in the vorticity equation associated with vortex stretching and bending and dilatation and bare clinic vorticity production, those all go away. And if you have a homogeneous base flow, what this says is that vorticity is just convected by the flow, or, or, or disturbances in vorticity are convected by the flow. The other type of, of fundamental disturbance mode is an acoustic disturbance mode, um, and it satisfies a wave equation. Um, and if you have net flow, it's a, it's a convective wave equation. So it's a fundamentally different type of equation. Um, and um, acoustic disturbances, as we'll talk about a little bit later, they're, they're, they, are, they propagate at the speed of sound. That's given by this expression, as opposed to vortical disturbances propagate with the flow. And then finally, entropy disturbances, the script S here denotes the entropy, is analogous to the vorticity. Vor velocity is a vector, excuse me, vorticity is a vector, obviously, but entropy is a scalar. But, they, but each, each component of the vorticity satisfies the same equation as the entropy. And what this tells you is entropy disturbances are just carried by the flow. All right. So again, I've kind of pulled this out of a hat, and I've just had you take my word for it because we only have, a, have an hour to get through this. But if you just trust me that there is these three fundamental types of disturbance modes, now what I want to do is I want to, inter I want to show you this canonical decomposition. And so what I'll say is, is, is that I can write every basically observable variable as the sum of these three disturbance modes. So for example, the pressure, and I've taken out the x and t just so it's clean. The pressure is equal to this, um, the contribution of the uh, acoustic mode to the pressure plus the contribution of the entropy mode to the pressure plus the contribution of the vortical disturbance to the pressure. All right? So or uh, another example would be you know, well, I mean, you could write it for every variable. So you have P1, you have rho 1, you have T1. These are all, and just to, just, so, just to be clear, these are functions of x and t, x and t. And you can write it as a sum. So I already wrote the one for the pressure. So the density would be this. Temperature, this. Etc. And even it, it's, it might be a little bit abstract for you to think about it. You can even write the entropy as the sum of the of the entropy fluctuation as the sum of the entropy induced by the acoustic mode, by the entropy mode, and by the vortical mode, and so forth. And so, what you can do then is you can take these equations, these expressions, you can substitute them back into your into your, these are, these are just derived straight out of the linearized Navier-Stokes equations. So you take Navier-Stokes equations, linearize them, subject to the assumptions, these pop out. And then you can substitute this decomposition into here. And because it's, because I've linearized, and, and, and this goes back to the infinitesimal 
perturbation approximation that I made. So if I have very, very small disturbances, I can neglect products of disturbances. How many of you know what I'm talking about when I say I'm going to linearize the equations? OK, good. All right, so I won't go through that. Um, so if I plop this into that, back into those equations, because the equations are linear, I can actually write three equations for each disturbance variable. Right? I can, just, I can do that. And so what I want to do now is I want to talk about each one of these canonical disturbance modes and how they manifest themselves. OK? And so we'll start with the vortical, the vorticity mode. All right? So this, this summarizes the key results on the vorticity mode. Um, so first of all, that it tells you vortical disturbances associated with the vorticity mode or satisfy a, con a convection equation, which, which kind of makes sense. But it's a little bit more interesting to look at this. So P1 omega is equal to 0. What does that mean? Well, so let's just make sure you're all calibrated. Right. So exactly. So what that says is that a vorticity disturbance, a, a, an infinitesimal vorticity disturbance, leads to no pressure disturbance. The pressure does not oscillate when you have a vorticity disturbance. So you have an infin, a, a, a very, very weak vortical disturbance which is convecting along. The pressure is not oscillating. It's a first order. All right. This is where the, 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 the linearization. Now obviously, in any real flow, the pressure does change, but that's a, that's a second order effect. So the amplitude of the pressure fluctuation is, is quadratically proportional to the amplitude of the vorticity perturbation. So it's not picked up by a linear analysis. What does this say? S1 omega 0. This says that an infinitesimal vorticity disturbance excites no entropy. Right? It's, it's an isentropic disturbance. This says that an infinitesimal vorticity disturbance is isothermal. The temperature doesn't change, which I think is probably sit, should, sit still, should sit right with you. It also says that it excites no oscillation in density. OK? So vorticity, a, for, a vorticity fluctuation manifests itself as a flow disturbance, which is convecting, but it is no fluctuations in pressure, entropy, temperature, or density. Um, I didn't explicitly show it here. It also turns out that it's incompressible. So the, well, I mean, it, that you can see that from the density, that, that the, the density or the volume of the fluid is not changing. And it's also a rotational disturbance. It's a vortical disturbance. So that's how an infinitesimal vorticity disturbance manifests itself in a homogeneous flow. Now let's talk about the acoustic mode. So what this equation says is that the pressure fluctuations induced by the acoustic mode satisfy a wave equation. Okay, so we already mentioned that. What does this say? Omega 1, omega one lambda, this is a lambda, right, is 0. What does that mean? What is that saying? It says acoustic pressure fluctuations don't excite any vorticity. All right. Um, acoustic pressure fluctuations are dilatational. They change the density, but they're irrotational. They're irrotational disturbances. They also are isentropic. Acoustic pressure, acoustic fluctuations do not cause the entropy to, to oscillate. What this right here says is that acoustic fluctuations are you do have oscillations in density, pressure, and temperature. But they're algebraically related at each point. Okay, so you don't have to solve a partial differential equation or an ordinary differential equation. If you know what the pressure is, you know right away what the density and the temperature are because they're algebraically related. And these are, these are isentropic relations. In fact, if you take the isentropic formula, you know, P equals C rho to the gamma, and you write P as equal to P naught plus P1, you linearize it, out it's going to pop this thing. And what this also says is that there is a, that acoustic fluctuations do cause fluid motions. The velocity is non-zero, but the pressure and the velocity are not algebraically related. They're related by a, um, um, a partial differential equation. I mean, this basically just says F equals MA, right? 
the force is, is, is on the right-hand side and mass times acceleration. Um, so acoustic fluctuations cause density and temperature fluctuations. They also cause the flow to move around. Okay, entropy disturbances. Um, all right, so P1S is zero. What does that say? That says that an entropy fluctuation causes no change in pressure. The pressure does not oscillate. This says it doesn't cause any, any um, vorticity disturbance, so a, a, an entropy fluctuation is irrotational. And it also causes no fluid motion. U is zero. All right? But an entropy fluctuation is associated with a disturbance in density and temperature. So oftentimes when people talk about entropy disturbances in systems, they, they call them hot spots because usually in combustion applications you have a region where the local temperature is higher than the ambient. And that would be a region of a, of a density, of, a, of an entropy fluctuation. That would be a convecting temperature disturbance. As opposed to an acoustic wave is also accompanied by a temperature disturbance, but that temperature disturbance is moving at the speed of sound. So what you can start seeing from this is that life's interesting. You know, if you're analyzing the, the dynamics of the temperature, and you know, if you're trying to understand why it's varying in space the way it is, you have to realize that what you're really looking at are two disturbances. The overall temperature you're measuring or computing is a superposition of one thing which is moving with the flow and another thing that's zinging along with the, with the speed of sound and that's reflecting off of things and bouncing around. So just to, let me just quickly summarize these then. I need to make a summary table here. So some of the key variables that, you're, that you'll be used to thinking about So if you think about it as these would be four things that you might go in and measure or, or compute, what this tells you is that, again, subject to our assumptions, I keep wanting to bring you back to those assumptions because as soon as we start including nonlinear effects or spatial variations in mean properties, there is going to be some changes to what I'm talking about. But what this says is that when you see a pressure fluctuation, you're, you're seeing an acoustic disturbance. This says that when you see a density disturbance, what's really happening is that it's a superposition of an acoustic wave moving at the speed of sound and an entropy disturbance. When you see, see temperature fluctuations, that's a superposition of an acoustic fluctuation and an entropy fluctuation. All right? And when you see the flow bouncing around, moving around, that's a superposition of an acoustic disturbance and a vortical disturbance. To have a pressure fluctuation? Uh, well, you could, so you could have one, either, or usually both. So for example, if you could somehow magically create locally an elevated temperature region without exciting sound, that, you know, these would be zero, and then it would be purely entropy. Or if you just had a sound wave, like when I'm talking to you, these are basically zero, and you'd have that. In most combustion applications, you have both of them coexisting. Same way with the velocity. Okay, so let's, let's just make a few comments on this decomposition. So, in a homogeneous uniform flow, these three disturbance modes propagate independently in the linear approximation. All right, so if we have infinitesimal disturbances or very weak disturbances, these three disturbances are independent of each other. So they're like ships passing in the night. They're all there, but they don't interact. They're just doing what they're doing. So once, you know, if you have an initial value problem where you have a, some, in, some initial disturbance which creates a, 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 an entropy field, a vorticity field, a, an acoustic field, those three disturbances then just go off and do their thing. They're convected if they're entropy or vorticity. They move away as sound waves if they're acoustic, but they don't interact with each other. All right. So they're completely decoupled um, 
from each other within your domain itself. And so, for example, in other words, the velocity fluctuation associated with vorticity, the velocity fluctuation associated with the acoustic, they're independent of each other, and each does whatever it's doing as if the other was not there. Um, the other thing about this is that these disturbances don't have any sources or sinks. All right, so if you go back to these e fundamental equations, these are all, s the right hand side is zero for all of them. You either have basically just a, a wave equation, which describes um, acoustic wave propagation with no changes in energy, or a convection equation, which describes propagation with no change in, in amplitude of a disturbance. Okay, now let's, where things start to get interesting is if you start comparing and contrasting the different features of these acoustic and entropy and vort vortical disturbances. So first of all, acoustic disturbances move at the speed of sound, right? Whereas vorticity and entropy disturbances move at the bulk flow. Um, so if we think about length scales now, acoustic properties like the temperature fluctuation associated with the acoustic field or the pressure, there's a, if it's a harmonic disturbance, it's going to be varying over some length scale. And that length scale will be what I'm going to call the acoustic wavelength, which you'll, you'll all be familiar with. It's just the ratio of the speed of sound divided by the frequency. All right. Now, if you harmonically excite a vortical or entropy disturbance, however, they're not moving at the speed of sound. And so their wavelength, the wavelength over which, you know, if you have, a, if you have this train of convecting vortices or this train of, of, of hot spots where the temperature is higher and, and, then, and then lower, then back higher, then lower, than the average, the length scale over those temperature disturbances or velocity disturbances, you know, things associated with entropy or vorticity, that length scale is what I'm going to call a convective length scale. I'll call that lambda c. That's the ratio of the mean flow velocity divided by the frequency. Okay? So what that means is in a low Mach number flow, you have two, lengths, two disturbance length scales, and they are very, very different from each other, right? They differ by the, the, the Mach number. Um, the ratio of the convective length scale to the acoustic length scale, which is, if I just take the ratio of this quantity to that quantity, the, the, the F cancels, and I get U, U naught over C, which is the Mach number. So this means that the acoustic component of the disturbance is a very long wavelength uh, or long length scale the vortical or entropy is a much shorter length scale. And so this has implications for things like dissipation or, or, or losses, which, which we're not going to have time to get into. But you know, bigger gradients drive diffusive transport, and, and things get smoothed out quicker. And so acoustic waves are very, very difficult to damp out. They just want to go because the, the length scale of them is so long that they, they're really not dissipated at all. Whereas the vortical or the entropy disturbances, they, they get smoothed out and smeared out much quicker because they have a, a shorter length scale, so they have a, a sharper gradient for a given, a given disturbance amplitude. Um, the other difference about them is that sound waves being true waves, and let me tell you what I mean by being a true wave. I should put uh, the word in quotes because I've called all these waves. In general, we, we define a wave as, as, as a, uh, a disturbance that propagates energy without propagating mass. That might be a good definition of a wave, right? So I'm propagating energy and information to you by talking, but I'm not walking up to each and every one of you. Whereas acoustic and entropy disturbances, energy and information is moving, but it's moving because I'm physically walking over and dropping it on each one of your desks, right? So. But sound waves, so being, being true waves, they, they're, they reflect off boundaries, right? So when I'm talking to you, sound is hitting the wall and it's bouncing off. It's hitting the top of the ceiling. Um, they also diffract around obstacles. So for example, if you were to open that door and somebody were to stand around the corner, you'd hear me talking, right? Because sound waves bend. They bend around things. Now, for those of you who are, who are laser people and do laser diagnostics, you might not be used to thinking about the, the wave um, about uh, diffraction, and that's because your, your, your uh, length scales are so short that diffraction becomes not so important. But sound waves being very long wavelength in general, they bend very nicely around things. You know, I could put a wall bong right in front of me, and you would still all, all hear me to pretty much the same extent as if I didn't have the wall there, versus if I had a flashlight in front of me, 
and I put a wall in front of you, none of you would see it because it's not really bending around. Um, and uh, just to, yeah, okay, but, but um, now we can differentiate this from entropy and vortical disturbances. They don't bounce off things, right? They're just carried with the flow. A vortex doesn't bounce off of stuff. It just moves with the flow. It moves wherever it goes. It doesn't diffract. You know, if I open that door and I send a puff of wind with a vortex, the only way that vortex would get to somebody who, who is around the corner is if the flow veered around and actually physically went to them. If the flow went straight and you were over here, you wouldn't see that vortical disturbance. So there's this difference in, in um, things don't reflect, they don't diffract or refract. Um, so, but because they're simultaneously present, you can get some interesting stuff happening. So just to give you an example, this is some data um, from Jackie O'Connor of a, uh, this is PIV data, and you, you, I'm not showing you the flame, but basically what, what, what she did in this experiment was she had acoustic waves moving, they're up and down in this experiment, they're moving up and down. They, um, and this is where the reactants are coming from, and so there was a flame which was stabilizing down here. And um, you can kind of, if you look at it, you can kind of see the vortices that are present in the flow. These acoustic waves uh, excite these separating shear layers, and so you, you, you excite uh, vortices, which can vec downstream. Uh, you, can, it's, you can't see it in the PIV, but, but you can clearly see that refraction is happening. Well, we know that refraction is happening because although you excite a wave which is just moving up and down, because of the oscillatory pressure field here, that wave actually bends and it causes the, the mass flow rate of reactants into this um, combustion chamber to oscillate. And so one of the things that really caught us when, when Jackie and I started looking at the amplitude of, of disturbances as a function of downstream distance, we saw some weird stuff. And I went, let's just, let's just walk through that. And in order to understand what, what, what you see, let's just think about a simple example. Let's assume that the velocity, let, let's say that, well, let's not assume. I've, I've told you that the velocity is a superposition of an acoustic and a vortical disturbance. And let's assume that the acoustic and vortical disturbances are just two traveling waves of identical amplitude. Well, excuse me, I won't assume identical amplitude yet. So of two traveling waves, all right? So here's an, this, this mathematically describes an acoustic wave with an amplitude of A sub lambda. And it's a traveling wave. It's a wave that's moving in the direction of positive x as time is increasing. So it's moving in the plus x direction. And it's moving at the speed of sound, c. Um, there's also this vortical disturbance, which is moving with the flow velocity, ux naught. Now, just to keep the uh, expression simple, let's assume that the amplitude of the acoustic and vortical disturbance are the same. So, and so we can just replace these a subscript lambda or a omega by just a. So if you add these two up, you can use some trigonometric identities and show you that the sum of this term and that term equals that. Now, what we have here, and so we've just, we've taken two terms which have both a space-time dependence, and we've now written it as a product. You'll see that this term right here has no time dependence. It only varies in space. This term right here has both this, is, this looks like a traveling wave, and it's doing something weird here. But it's basically, th this describes uh, modulation in time of the disturbance. So the velocity field is oscillating harmonically at each point as cosine omega t with some spatial phase shift. But what it also tells you is that if you measure the amplitude of the velocity fluctuations, it's varying as cosine c naught minus u naught times x over 2 c naught u naught. So in other words, what I mean by that is this. Let me just show you, if you're not used to thinking about traveling waves and standing waves. So let's just say I have a pipe, whatever. This is, this is the direction of plus x. If I were to measure the velocity fluctuations here, what I would see is that it's oscillating in time. All right? It's oscillating in time. That's the omega t. There's some phase shift here given by that term there. And it's oscillating in time with some amplitude. OK? Right there. If I were to measure the pressure oscillations here, what that tells you is 
there's this cosine C naught minus U naught over 2 C naught U naught spatial dependence. So it would still oscillate harmonically. It would have some phase shift, but it wouldn't have the same amplitude, right? So it might look something like this. It's the same frequency. I shouldn't change the frequency. But you can see that the amplitude of oscillations is different. If I were to measure it somewhere else, it would have some phase shift and the amplitude might be even less. It might look like that. Okay? And so, in fact, there would be locations where it's possible to identify a location where this term is zero, so that would mean that there is no flow fluctuation there at all. All right? Yes, sir? So you're right, there's a unit issue. I don't know, there's a mistake. You're right, my units aren't matching up. But, but, I, but take my word for it, you get this, this uh, type of this behavior, this standing wave. But the main thing is, is this thing, at some, there is an x value at which that term is going to go to zero. So what that means is, if I took just the acoustic wave, there is no x value where the acoustic wave is zero for all time. There's no, if I took just the vortical disturbance, there's no x value where the acoustic disturbance is zero for all time. If I add them up, you get a destructive interference effect where there are certain locations where the velocity disturbance is bigger than both of them and somewhere it's smaller. Yes, sir? Yeah, 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 I, I just have to, I, messed up when I worked out my trig identity and I'm, the, the, the question is, the units here aren't right. Something, this, this doesn't work. Um, okay. Now, um, so we can actually, so what this, okay, so like I said, that what that tells you is you're going to have this spatial variations. So just to illustrate, if you go back to this experiment that I had here, when you measure the amplitude of the velocity fluctuations as a function of downstream distance, these were the measurements. And, and it clearly showed you this modulation. Um, and so what we did was we actually fit the data and, you know, we, we said, oh, okay, what we can actually do from this data, this, this spatial interference pattern, this is telling us that we have both acoustic and vortical disturbances present simultaneously, or we would not get this interference pattern. If we only had acoustic disturbances, we would see this type of pattern. This is the magnitude of the velocity as a function of x. If we only had vortical disturbances, this is what we'd see. But when we add them up, we see something that looks like that. Um, OK, so just the, 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 I ran through this example in order to illustrate for you that because, oops, I erased it, but because of these disturbance have these different space-time dynamics, their superposition, which is what you're actually interested in, that's what you're measuring, is what's disturbing the flame, can potentially have some, some interesting stuff going on because of those different dynamics. One's convecting, the other's propagating as, as a sound wave. One's reflecting, the other's not. When you take a combustion chamber, um, if you excite, let's just say the flame is exciting all three of these types of disturbances. Well, the vorticity, if you have an open, if your if your combustor has just it's just an open piece of pipe at the end, those vorticity and entropy disturbances are just convecting out and they leave the system. Whereas the open end of a pipe is a really efficient sound wave reflector, the sound wave the sound energy gets trapped. Let me let me draw that. Um, so the reason we're going to be spending lots of time talking about acoustic waves rather than than say entropy disturbances. It, it, Again, let's just say that I have a flame, it's doing this. The flame, the heat release is oscillating. We won't get into it, but when the heat release oscillates, it's making entropy disturbances, it's making acoustic, it's making vorticity disturbances. The acoustic and entropy, they just, they say, okay, thank you, and then they leave, they're gone, right? So they, they don't come back to bother you. Whereas the sound wave goes like this, and it comes back. That's a big difference is that that these, that these waves, there's different filters, there's different transfer functions that get acted on these, these disturbances once they, uh, once they get excited.
All right. Um, so last comment is if we go back to the first page where we started this discussion, we made some pretty significant assumptions here. We said, let's assume that they're infinitesimal disturbances. Let's assume I have a spatially homogeneous background flow. Now I just want to very quickly on one slide talk about what changes when that's not true. Um, so first of all, we said that these modes propagate independently subject to those assumptions. In reality, you can get coupling between these, these disturbances. And there's three basic processes that cause coupling. First of all, any boundary condition will cause coupling. All right? So for example, when a sound wave hits a wall, right? so if I have a sound wave, it hits this wall at an angle, um, the wall doesn't differentiate between sound waves and vortical disturbances. It just says that you can't, you got to have no slip, no, the, the tangential velocity has got to be zero, the normal velocity has got to be zero, right? And that causes the acoustic and vortical disturbances to couple. And so what, what actually, what happens then is a sound wave hits the wall, it actually excites a, vor a vorticity disturbance. So, which kind of makes sense. Sound waves, and that's actually, when you're used to thinking about when, when sound waves hit walls, they're damped by the walls. They're not really damped, just the energy in the acoustic disturbance gets passed into a vorticity disturbance. So really the energy has moved from one form of disturbance to another. Um, that's one good example. Um, excuse me, somebody keeps texting me. Um, the, uh, another example where you can get coupling is when you, I said if you have an open pipe, the entropy and the vorticity disturbances just propagate away and they never come back. Okay, now the reason I said it's got to be open is, is that if you add, if you accelerate the flow, you add a nozzle, it turns out that that region of flow inhomogeneity, which is that second bullet, so now the velocity is not, no longer spatially constant. The flow is varying, the velocity is varying spatially. It turns out that when you accelerate an entropy disturbance, you make sound. All right? So in other words, the flame is pumping energy into the acoustic field, the entropy field, the vorticity field. The sound wave goes zinging away. It hits the nozzle. It bounces back. The entropy disturbance convects along. It, it, it stays. It just does whatever. It's ignoring the sound wave. But once it gets accelerated, it makes sound. So the entropy disturbance comes convecting along. Bang, you make sound, and then that sound wave propagates back up, but actually also propagates out. Um, so that's, a, that's another way in which these disturbances couple in a region of inhomogeneity. By the way, I was just talking with somebody about this mechanism yesterday for acoustic frequencies. Yeah, there you go. So this is why that happens. It, and, it, and it only happens if you have a contraction. If you have an open piece of pipe, you lose that coupling mechanism. But what happens is, is the reason that you get this is that an entropy disturbance is, is a leads is a disturbance in density. And so it takes a certain, um, because you're accelerating the flow, it takes a pressure drop to accelerate a flow, right? You got to have a higher pressure here than here. Um, and so if, but if the density of the packet of fluid that you're, you're shoving through the nozzle is oscillating, it takes an oscillatory force, an oscillatory pressure drop across this nozzle to shove that entropy disturbance through the nozzle. And we know that pressure disturbances are, are acoustic disturbances. So that's another good example. By the way, I'm not going to have time to get into this, but this coupling of entropy and acoustic waves at nozzles is a big deal because it's responsible for something called indirect combustion noise. Um, when a, fl a flame makes sound, it both makes acoustic waves, which you hear, direct combustion noise, but it also makes entropy disturbances, which when convected through the nozzle also makes sound. And so there's a lot of, there's actually a big program in the, in the European Union on indirect noise, combustion noise. And uh, there's a lot of discussion whether things like auxiliary power units and aircraft engines, they're noisy. You got to wear heads, you know, the workers got on the ramp have to wear headphones. But there's a, there's a lot of debate over whether that's direct combustion noise or indirect combustion noise. Um, uh, well, let's do another example. Another way that these can couple is at a, across a flame. These disturbances all couple across a flame. So for example, here's my flame. 
when a sound wave, let's just say it's a planar sound wave, when a sound wave propagates through a flame, which it does, sound wave, it's, it's partially reflected because there's a temperature jump across the flame, but it's, it, it's both transmitted through the flame and reflected, but it also creates oscillations in entropy and it creates the oscillations in, in vorticity. Does anybody have any ideas why a sound wave might make a vorticity disturbance, might, might make vorticity? Uh, Baroclinic, Baroclinic torque, exactly. So if you remember the, the vorticity equation, there's this term on the right-hand side that looks like this. And whenever you have a density gradient misaligned with a pressure gradient, you make vorticity. And so if the, if the flame was flat, you wouldn't make vorticity. But in general, the flame is at some angle. And so sound waves propagating through flames make vorticity. So that's what I had here. Um, accelerating an entropy disturbance generates an acoustic wave. We talked about that. The last way that you can get coupling is because of nonlinearity. All right? So in other words, if we turn off the small amplitude assumption, Nonlinear effects can cause coupling. The best example for that is jet noise. I don't know if any of you have worked on aeroacoustics or jet noise problems, but a high velocity turbulent jet can make a lot of noise, but you can't understand it with linear acoustics. You've got to include nonlinearities. And basically what's happening is, is turbulent vorticity fluctuations, they nonlinearly interact with each other and they cause a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of compressibility of the fluid. So we like to think that low Mach number flows are incompressible, and they almost are. But if you want to understand the sound generated by a low Mach number flow, you've got to include that teeny weeny bit of compressibility. And basically, it's, it's a nonlinear effect that a, a vorticity disturbance is almost incompressible, but not quite. That tiny little bit of compressibility propagates away. And it's, it's because that is such a small effect, that's what makes predicting jet noise such a really, really hard problem. Is, is uh, you know, like if you're trying to compute it, you know, your numerical noise can exceed the acoustic noise by orders of magnitude um, if you don't know what you're doing. Okay, so in, let, let me just wrap up here this, this section. So I, in, in a combusting environment where you have boundaries which reflect sound waves, you have temperature gradients, you have flow acceleration regions, what this shows you is, is that in regions where everything's homogeneous, all these disturbances are pretty much on their own. They're propagating at the sound speed or at the flow speed. But once you start moving into regions of inhomogeneity, across temperature jumps, um, in regions of flow acceleration, they start interacting with each other, and energy moves around. You might, the flame might deposit energy into the acoustic wave, but then that, as it moves across the flame, some of that, uh, excuse me, as it moves through a, um, through some, uh, across a shear flow, the acoustic wave would then deposit some of that energy into the vorticity wave and so forth. Does anyone have any questions? Let's uh, take a break. It's 3.06, so let's reconvene at 3.15.